Welcome everyone to one more session of Abralin ao Vivo, Abralin Linguistics Online Series, an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association designed to give students and researchers free access to discussions of a diverse range of topics related to the study of human language. I am Diego Leite de Oliveira. I'm a professor of Russian linguistics at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And it's an honor for me today to introduce Professor Laura Yanda as our guest speaker. Laura Yanda is a professor of Russian linguistics at the University of Tromsø, Norway. She holds degrees from Princeton University and UCLA and has been a prominent researcher in many fields of Slavic and cognitive linguistics for at least three decades, investigating a diverse range of phenomena and providing innovative approaches to the analysis of grammatical categories and constructions in Slavic languages. During her career as a teacher and a researcher, it's possible to identify a special interest in the category of verbal aspect, which resulted in a large set of publications, including her first book entitled A Semantic Analysis of Russian Verbal Prefixes, Za, Piri, Do, and Ot, published in 1986, and the book entitled Why Russian Spectral Prefixes Aren't Empty, which was published in 2012 as a result of a research made in cooperation with a team integrating the CLEAR group, an abbreviation for Cognitive Linguistics, Empirical Approaches to Russian, coordinated by Professor Yanda. Recently, her current projects include a huge research on the Russian Constructicon, the network of Russian constructions, and is designed in collaboration with several researchers, both from the University of Tromsø and from other universities. In addition to publications on linguistic topics, Professor Yanda has published textbooks and authored and contributed to internet-based resources for learners of Russian. Today, Professor Yanda will talk to us about the verb classifier hypothesis concerning Russian verbal aspect system. The title of her talk is Verb Classifiers, not so exotic after all, the case of Russian. Professor Yanda, uh, on behalf of Anna Berlin, I would like to thank you for agreeing to give this talk today and for participating at the Abralin Linguist Online series. Uh, before I hand over to Professor Yanda, I would like to remind everyone attending this talk that questions can be asked in the chat. I'll follow along and I'll be glad to read them to Professor Yanda at the end of her talk. Professor Yanda, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm going to start my video here, and then I'm also going to share my screen. Just one second, and we'll be ready to go. Okay. So let me also move this out of the way here. Okay, so I want to thank you, thank the organizers very much for the great honor of appearing in this series. And also I wanted to thank everybody who is watching. Um, I, my purpose today is to try to prove to you that the uh, Russian aspectual prefixes are verb classifiers. And maybe you don't think that's very exciting or who I should I care. Uh, but I'm going to show you a, um, a system that otherwise looks very complicated and um, chaotic um, and maybe even rather intimidating. But when we understand this system as a system of verb classifiers, I think it, it makes a lot more sense. It's much more coherent and it makes it possible for us both as linguists and as uh, teachers of a language to uh, give a better, a clearer picture of what is actually going on. So just a sec. So here are my collaborators. Most of these people are or have been at uh, UIT, the uh, the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø with me, except for Stephen Dickey, 
who's at the uh, University of Kansas. So although I'm presenting this work uh, on my own today, uh, I've had a lot of people working with me and it would have been impossible to get all of this work done all by myself. So it, it really does take a village as they say. Okay, so here's an overview of the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to briefly tell you how we got started on this idea. Um, then I'm going to give a uh, crash course in Russian aspect and have the role of verbal prefixes in that. Uh, next is another crash course on um, what are called numeral classifiers and why they really are noun classifiers. And that's kind of important in order to set up the analogy that we're going to be focusing on today. And that is that um, there, that there is a, an analogy between nouns and verbs here. Uh, so we have what are called numeral classifiers that are noun classifiers. And these are, par these are parallel to uh, the prefixes as verb classifiers. So that the next part of the talk then is the meat of the talk where we go to um, verb, uh, verb classifiers. And then um, I want to show you that we actually gain even more insights in terms of typological parallels once we have recognized the Russian prefixes as verb classifiers. So how it all started. Uh, this is just one slide, and it's really about just this one person um, who I was very fortunate to meet at a conference. Uh, this is William McGregor, and um, and uh, I had the great fortune of listening to his talk, and he listened to our talk about, uh, about uh, Russian prefixes, and we agreed that there might be some more to look into there. Um, we read also his book. Uh, called Verb Classification in Australian Languages. And at that point, um, uh, verb classification had been recognized as a fairly rare uh, phenomenon in some you know, exotic languages, if you will. Uh, some it happens occasionally in Chinese and then in you know, these Australian languages. But McGregor um, gives us this tantalizing quote in his book. And he says, doubtless verb classification is not confined to the relatively few languages in which it has been hitherto described, though the extent of its distribution across the world's languages remains to be charted. So, um, and after comparing our ideas and our data sets, we agreed that what's going on in Russian and uh, most likely also across all of the Slavic languages is indeed um, verb classification. If this is the case, then this means a verb classification is not really something rare or exotic because the Slavic languages, that's a, a very big subfamily of the uh, Indo-European languages. And so if this is something that is, um, that is very common across those languages, then we should think of verb classifier systems as being, being something more important that uh, linguists might want to pay attention to. Okay, so here's uh, going to be our crash course on Russian verbal prefixes. And um, I promise that this will be as painless as possible. So I know that um, oftentimes uh, non-Slavists, when the Slavists begin to talk about aspect and, uh, and aspectual prefixes, uh, that uh, they find this, um, they, they, they find that they soon get lost. But I promise you we're going to stick just to bare facts that are, that are going to be just enough to give you an appreciation of the system without, uh, without getting lost. So um, aspect in Russian. Um, in Russian, we have a perfective versus imperfective relationship or, and in this one, um, the actually the markedness is the reverse of what we see in most languages of the world that have perfective versus imperfective. So perfective is the marked member as opposed to imperfective. But most important is that all forms of all verbs express aspect. So unlike, for example, the Romance languages where perfective versus imperfective is a distinction that is made only in past tenses of verbs, this is made in all tenses of verbs. It's also made in uh, the infinitive forms of verbs. It's made in the imperative forms of verbs, gerunds, participles, you name it. And in fact, in some of the other Slavic languages, there is even perfective versus imperfective de-verbal de nouns. 
So, so aspect is a very big part of the system, in a sense, even more important than tense for uh, verbs. Okay, so the major patterns of the of the aspectual morphology that mark this are as follows. These are uh, these are only the major patterns. There are other possibilities, and actually, as I say oh, oh, everywhere on this slide, it's nearly all. And and because in Russian, it's almost impossible to um, so it's it's almost impossible to draw hard and fast rules because there are almost always exceptions and sometimes quite a few exceptions. But these are the most important patterns, and this covers the vast majority of the verbal language, ver verbal lexicon. So we have simplex verbs. So in other words, that means verbal stems that do not have any aspectual morphology. And these are nearly always imperfectives, like this verb here, delet, which means do. Uh, if you add a prefix to a simplex stem, usually you will get a perfective verb. That perfective verb might have the same meaning as the imperfective, as in the case of zdelitz, where we added s to delitz, and now we have just the perfective of do. Or it can also give you a new meaning or a more, uh, a more focused meaning, as in the example here with the prefix piri, where piri delitz means redo, and it's also a perfective verb. We can also add suffixes. And so then you have not only the simplex stem, but the perfectivizing prefix and, a, and an imperfectivizing suffix. And here we get secondary imperfectives. So for example, we have the suffix uva in this example with piri, piri djeluvits is then the imperfective partner verb of that piri djeluvits redo. However, the only thing you really need to focus on in this talk is this type here. So the prefixed verbs where we have a prefix plus a simplex. And all of the ones that we're going to be looking at actually are perfective. So um, yeah, so now, now to impress you with uh, how um, large and complex this system is, there are 17 such prefixes like s and pire. Uh, that can form perfective verbs by being added to an imperfective simplex stem. Uh, and so these prefixes are on the left here. There are 17 of them. 16 of them, all of except for do, can, can also make a uh, verb that merely means, uh, that merely is the perfective partner, just like we had delets, zdelets, those both mean do. So zdelets is the perfective partner of delets. So 16 of these perform that function. Um, and, uh, and already that raises a question. If you have a if if you have a language and you want to add a prefix in order to change a verb from um, an imperfective verb to a perfective verb, how many prefixes would you really need? Only one. But here we have 16. So why do we have 16? And actually, there's a, the 17th that only makes uh, verbs with special meanings. Um, and to uh, in in order to like foreshadow the whole point of this talk, the idea is here is that these prefixes sort the verbs according to their meanings and according to the outcomes that are to be described. And um, and the uh, basic meaning of all of these prefixes we get here in the second column, I call this the prototypical path meaning because this is the path or the sort of like the landmark trajectory path that is described when we add any of these prefixes to a verb of motion, like a verb of to walk, to swim, to fly, and to, to ride in a vehicle, et cetera. So for example, if I take the verb, uh, the verb to walk and I have do, then I, then, then I can reach a place by walking with ease. It's go out of a place for walking, for example, pri plus walk is to arrive by walking. So, so these are all of the meanings that you get when you add to any kind of motion verb, but also to many other verbs. And then there are further related meanings. Um, yeah, so, so this, is a, this is rather a huge system and you can imagine already in teaching this to, to, teaching this to students, they have to memorize which, 
which of these goes with which verbs, not just when we're moving, but all verbs, because all verbs can, uh, can get some sort of prefix. Okay, so a little bit more about these prefixed verbs, the ones that have the prefix plus the simplex. We can say that there are four types of them and they come in a sense into in two groups. We have the resultative groups, the ones like zdelets and pirigelets, we call zdelets a natural perfective because it has the same meaning as the simplex imperfective. Whereas we call pirigelets a specialized perfective because in addition to adding perfective, it also changes the meaning of the simplex imperfective. Then we also have um, we also have what are called procedurals, um, and these are not about results. So we have the complex act perfectives, which indicate a certain amount of an activity. For example, chitait means to read, and po means some. So this is do some reading, read for a while, and and then go for a walk, for example. Uh, and we also have do something just once. So we have a verb gupit, act stupid. And add prefix s to that, that can be do one stupid thing. And again, foreshadowing a little bit more of what's going to go on in this talk, um, the, um, these prefixes on natural perfectives have been called empty because they don't add any meaning. Um, uh, but but my uh, what I'm going to try to prove to you is that what they're actually doing is overlapping in meaning rather than being devoid of meaning. And that, that there are two types of classifiers. We're going to learn about these in a minute. There are sortal and natural classifiers, but that the resultative uses are um, the parallels of sortal classifiers. We're sorting verbs according to the types of results we get. And the procedural uses are like the natural classifiers where we, um, where we are measuring a bit of an activity. So that's my that that's the entire crash course. Now we're going to have our or that's the entire crash course on Russian prefixes. Now we're going to go into the crash course on numeral classifiers and why they are actually nominal classifiers. Um, but first, I want to show you this map of numeral classifiers systems worldwide. And what I really want to focus on in this map is the places where they aren't. And a really important place where, they are, where there are no obligatory numeral classifier systems are over, is over here in Europe. And of course, most of modern linguistics has its um, you know, philosophical and theoretical roots in, in European traditions. And uh, in Europe, there were no uh, numeral classifier systems uh, handy. So this is so classifier systems have not, in general, been very high on the radar screens. Although Walls does have this uh, map of numeral classifier systems, there is no Walls map of verb classifier systems. You can think of verb classifier system as being, you know, one more one step more abstract from the noun, the noun classifiers or numeral classifier systems. So um, this is perhaps part of why. Um, even the numeral classifier systems have not been adequately um, adequately understood by uh, by people coming from these European traditions, and much less so even the verb classifier systems. So, but what do these numeral classifiers do? We'll look at some examples in a minute. But here in the abstract, um, they, as I said, they are actually noun classifiers. This, this term numeral classifiers, I will continue to use it because it is the traditional term, but it's a misnomer. They should be called nominal classifiers or noun classifiers. What do they do? They are unitizers. They construe the reference of nouns as countable units. So in other words, they make everything into count nouns. Um, and there are uh, usually understood to be two types of classifiers, the sortal and the menstrual. The sortal classifiers, um, as it makes sense from their name, they sort the nouns of the language into groups according to the units that they typically form. This is often according to shape, like long objects, flat objects, round objects, etc. Although it doesn't have to be according to shape, it can be can involve also animacy, edibility. There can be there can be other kinds of uh, kinds of um, 
parameters here, but the parameter of shape is one that's most common. And also it's the one that is most pertinent for the analogy that I wanna to draw to verbs. So, so that's what we're going to focus on here. And then there are also mensural classifiers, which create non-inherent units of mass nouns by using measures like a bit or a cup of something. Let's go to uh, some examples. So um, the numeral classifiers are called numeral classifiers because they were first noticed as being obligatory in constructions with numerals. But this doesn't mean that that's the only place where they can occur. They can be used in other constructions too. Here are some examples from Mandarin Chinese. So we have the word for snake, and then we have a classifier, which means long, thin. And then here we have a numeral. So this is your classic numeral classifier construction with the numeral, the classifier, and the noun. So then two snakes. But we can use this uh, classifier, this same classifier also without the numeral, just and just say this long thin snake, in other words, this snake. Or if I've already been talking about the snake and I know what I'm referring to, then I can just use the demonstrative and this and, and the classifier and just say, you know, this thing. So with the, with the classifier. So, I mean, in that sense already, the, talking about it as numeral classifier, we already see that that's, that's not, that doesn't make sense because the numeral isn't obligatory. And actually the thing that the, um, that the classifier is referring to isn't the numeral, it's the noun. Here's some more examples from John Lucy's work on Yucatec Maya. So we have, um, we have a group of examples. In all of these examples, we have the numeral one, then we have a classifier, and then we have a noun. And so we have, you know, one long thin wax is a candle, one long thin wood is a stick, one long thin corn is an ear of corn, et cetera, et cetera. But what's important to remember in these set, this set of examples is that when, um, when Western linguists first came to look at this system, uh, they thought that they thought that um, this noun here actually meant candle because that's what this noun was usually meant usually meant. Um, and then they thought that this classifier was kind of semantically empty. Why would you need it? Because all candles are long and thin. So why would you say one long thin candle when you could just say one candle? So the idea was that they seem to be semantically sometimes empty. Um, uh, but uh, but the fact is that ultimately it was discovered that that what the noun actually meant was wax and it's just that the most common units of wax are long thin, long thin things that are candles. Um, so, but, uh, but and, and then we can see how else this works. So we have long thin, one long thin wood, that's a stick, one long thin corn, that's an ear of corn. If we have, now we have four examples here with the noun for banana. If we have one long thin banana, that's, that refers to the fruit of the banana, but flat banana, that's a banana leaf planted banana, <clears throat> excuse me, is a banana tree, and a bit of banana is just a bit of banana. And these first six examples here are what we would call sort of classifiers, because here we're sorting things according to the units. And uh, the last one is a mensual classifier where, 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 we're, where we're just taking a measured amount of a banana. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to show you, like expand on what you see here. You see here that this classifier, this one classifier can occur with multiple, not multiple nouns with, and maybe do slightly different things with those multiple nouns. And also we can have with one noun, multiple classifiers. So we're going to expand first on this last type where we have one noun with multiple classifiers. Here's an example from Burmese with the word for river with eight different classifiers. Notice that all of these um, phrases begin with the word river and the numeral one, and then we have a classifier. So we have a default classifier, which is actually the same as the noun. Classifiers, uh, nominal classifiers are often derived themselves from noun. 
So this is uh, just a one river. But we can also think we can construe a river in different ways. We can be thinking about it in different ways. We can think of it as a place where we might go to do something, you know, to have a pic picnic. Uh, we could also be looking at a river on a map where it just looks like a line. Um, we can be thinking about some part of the river uh, as being a good place for fishing or a longer part of the river as being a path to the sea. We can also think of a river as being a link between two places, like a, a way to get from two different villages. We could also be talking about a river in the context of the mythology of the Burmese culture. And uh, we could also be talking about not any given river, but sort of rivers in general as an abstract concept. So you, we can have multiple different um, construals of river that are provided by various classifiers. We can also go in the other direction and look at how one classifier can have multiple functions and how this function can also be to some extent related to the degree of overlap, semantic overlap between the classifier itself and the thing it is classifying. So here we're going to look again at Mandarin Chinese. Uh, here we're looking at a classifier that means flat things like slices. And here we have a phrase that is three slice leaf. And here the class, the meaning of the classifier overlaps really, really strongly with the meaning of the noun. So, uh, so here we have a sort of a default classifier. This is this we're sorting according to shape in this case. But we can also use this same classifier for other things. So we can have a group of cars, I guess, parked um, probably on a flat place, maybe. Um, and then we can also take wood and, and uh, cut it in three pieces relatively flat, or also three slices of carrot, or sorry, and, sorry in this case, 10 slices of carrot. So we see that um, both the uh, both a noun can take multiple classifiers and get its meaning focused in different ways, and a classifier can go with different nouns and have different meanings with different nouns. Keep this in mind because this is something we're going to come back to when we go to the Russian prefixes. So now we're coming to the main part of this talk. Here's, here's what we're going to talk about is why Russian prefixes are verb classifiers parallel to these uh, so-called numeral classifiers that we just looked at. Okay, so Russian prefixes like the um, numeral classifiers are unitizers in that they designate discrete events. So here the analogy is between discrete objects and discrete events. And they also um, provide some uh, quantification by perfective aspect, because this um, perfective aspect gives us discrete events, things, uh, events that are countable, if you will. The resultative uh, uses sort the verbs. So in here we have classification by outcome. So we have, for example, um, we have this verb puchnutz, which means um, swell on its own. And we have the um, prefix ras, which has among its meanings, the meaning swell. And so it makes sense that we put together ras with puchnutz and get ras puchnutz. Krast means to steal. Steal involves taking something away from somebody. So the move away meaning uh, that u has overlaps with the meaning of uh, the meaning of the verb. And so it makes sense that these would go together. Um, then we have lipnutz, which means stick uh, in the sense of like uh, of like glue or tape. And pri means attach. And so pri lipnutz it makes sense here because we've got the, we we have an overlap here, and these are all these all behave as sortal classifiers. We also have these procedural uses, which create non-inherent units. So we have, for example, the verb sitates, which means to sit, um, and then there is a prefix po, which means some for a while, and so then we have pa sitates, sit for a while, and then maybe go for a walk. Um, and we also have pro, meaning through. 
and the verb plakets, which means to cry. And so we could have something, we could say something like paraplakets sunoch, like cry all through the night. And these uh, behave like menstrual classifiers. Um, here's a bit of an idea of how the prefixes sort the verbs in Russian. Here we're looking only at the so-called natural prefixes where the, um, where the uh, meaning of the prefix is not obvious. It's just adding the meaning plus perfective. And um, although this isn't strictly speaking a closed class, there are approximately 1400 simplex verbs that with one or more um, perfectives, uh, perfectivizing prefixes form natural perfectives using these 16 prefixes. And this is how they are they are arranged approximately. Um, so some of them have very big groups and some of them have very small groups, but you can imagine uh, that this looks right like a rather um, daunting and complex system um, because if you were to learn this language, it, it, it seems like you need to memorize, you know, which 68 verbs I have to use ras with and which, you know, 177 verbs I have to use na with, et cetera, et cetera. And these are just the natural perspectives of which there's, you know, around 2000 of. Um, and then there are all of the additional uh, verbs where it's uh, where, where you can make the um, specialized and um, complex actants and single act perfectives. Um, those together probably uh, are number in the tens of thousands and are not, that's not really a closed class at all. That's an open class. So just to kind of like give you an idea, but this does look like, does look like sorting. Um, so some, uh, some uh, more abstract parallels, uh, just to kind of sum up what we've done so far, we have um, both for nouns and verbs, we have a unitizer, that's the numeral classifier for nouns and the aspectual prefix for verbs. We have quantification association with numerals for nouns and with perfective aspect for verbs. In both cases, we have kind of a spatial profile. So we have this um, uh, classification according to some sort of a shape in space. Um, for the verbs, uh, we have this trajectory landmark path relation that I described, and that is becomes most obvious with uh, verbs of motion. Um, but their etymological sources are somewhat different. The, uh, the noun classifiers tend to stem from nouns, whereas the aspectual prefixes tend to stem from prepositions or particles, meaning things like to and through and over and, and on. Okay. So, and this, this also is to give you a sort of a sense of that this is not just about Russian, this is really about uh, Slavic languages in general, um, and that one verb may combine with various prefixes. So remember back to the example we had with the river in Burmese, and we had eight different classifiers here, there. Here we're gonna look at three different classifiers on one, uh, one verb, uh, pisats to write, and, and we can see that this works not just for Russian, but also for Czech, Polish, um, uh, uh, Bosnian, Croatian, Ser Serbian, uh, Bulgarian, and late common Slavic. So we have um, uh, na is, uh, is a prefix that means something like surface, like do something on a surface and writing is something we do on a surface. So that's the natural perfective from the pisites. V means in or into. So this is how you insert something in a text is with p sites. And za means to like fix something in a, in a, in a, in a spot. And so we have uh, za pisats to record or register. And this, this kind of pattern goes through all of our Slavic languages. We can continue this also even with a single uh, verb. I think maybe you noticed in that, um, slide I had earlier with the graph uh, that there are more natural perfectives than the simplex imperfectives. And that's because there are some, uh, there are some simplex imperfectives that have multiple um, prefixes even for their natural perfectives. So for example, this verb gruzitz means load. Um, and if you look in your dictionary, uh, there will be three um, perfectives listed for it with three different um, prefixes as if they were all synonymous, but they aren't quite synonymous. So we have na, as I told you just before, na has to do with surfaces. So 
surface load, this focuses on accumulation of loaded objects, like loading a bag with fine goods. Um, poor uh, just means result here, and it's perhaps the most neutral one, can be used even for loading things you don't usually load, like the bodies of wounded soldiers. Um, and we also have za, uh, which, uh, which um, has to do with filling things up. So we, we are usually, usually focuses on the states that are resulting for the vehicle that is being loaded. Now to go in the opposite direction um, and look at how one prefix may have various functions. Remember back to the example we had with that um, Mandarin Chinese with the, um, the classifier that meant slice. So let's look at uh, look at this with well four different prefixes, each with with having different functions here. So we have um, we have our uh, uh, ras um, uh, 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 prefix, which means swell, and with uh, with puchnutz there's just an overlap. But dutz just means blow. However, you add a ras to dutz, and we have inflate, so like like blowing up a balloon, if you will. Um, we already saw krast and ukrast with steel, where u means away. But if I add u to bijat, which means run, then I have u bijat, which just means run away. Um, we already saw uh, lipnuts pri lipnuts to stick to something, where pri means attach, uh, where, where we have um, vizat, which means tie, which can just be mean tie a knot or whatever, but Previsites uh, means to tie something onto something else. Uh, Nochivats, uh, this is um, derived from noch, uh, night, which is a length of time which goes from point A to point B. And there's a verb, nochivats, to spend the night. And piri means to go from one end to the other. So we have piri nochivats, uh, where we have high degree of overlap there. But we have a low degree of overlap with zdats, which just means wait. But here, pirishdats would mean to wait through something, a specific time or a specific event. So we see um, a high degree of overlap with natural perfectives that only change the aspect and don't add any meaning. But we see with specialized perfectives that we've added perfective and a meaning. So we've changed blow to inflate, run to run away, tie to tie onto, and wait to wait through something. Um, so, and, and there's no really crisp division between natural perfectives and specialized perfectives. I imagine that natural perfectives are the perfectives for which the meaning of the base verb and the meaning of the prefix overlap most. These combinations just happen to be the best match. They also tend to be the most frequent, on average 10 times more frequent than specialized perfectives but also, I mean, in terms of type frequency, much lower. So, there, so we tend to see these as natural perfectives and as we go down for, towards specialized perfectives and um, on a scale and dictionaries tend to draw the line here um, that these, these tend to always mean into or in, in, into pieces. Um, whereas, you know, certainly further down as in talkats just means to push and shove but rastalkats would be to push everything away from something. And mitats is to sweep what you do with a broom. And naraz mitats means to scatter things by sweeping. So you can see that the meanings gradually become, the meanings of the prefix, the, of the prefix gradually becomes more and more obvious, if you will. Okay, so now we're going to move on to this um, beyond sortal, also to mensural classifiers and remind ourselves what sortal versus mensural classifiers are for nominal or numeral classifiers, and then uh, draw that analogy over to the uh, Russian verbal prefixes. So um, notice that the um, here we have uh, we have in uh, Mandarin Chinese a sortal and mensural classifier examples. So we have one long thin rope and one glass beer. And the um, construction itself has exactly the same um, structure. Um, and here the sortal one, because ropes are long and thin, it refers to the type of unit, whereas beer doesn't naturally come in glasses, but we can put it in glasses. 
Um, so, and, and as we saw earlier, also a single classifier can serve both sortal and menstrual functions. And we also have uh, the possibility of general classifiers that serve both functions. Okay, so, um, well, so here in order to like make this in the, we'll make this in the abstract and then I'll show you some actual examples of the differences between numerous ex examples of um, sortal classifiers and numeral and menstrual classifiers for the verbal prefixes. So um, th th as we saw, the sortal classifiers make reference to inherent boundaries. This is similar to the natural perfectives and specialized perfectives, whereas the menstrual classifiers impose external boundaries and since verbs are about activities that take place over time, these are generally temporal boundaries uh, about how much you do something. And we call these procedural prefixes, also known as super lexical or axiom sort prefixes. Okay, so some examples, just a sec here. So we already saw this uh, example of a menstrual classifier for a numeral classifier, one cla glass of beer. And we also saw this, we already saw this example also of the um, little bit of banana. Um, and this, I, I, I argue, is similar to the uh, classifier that we have here with C dates. SIT uh, does not have a natural result, uh, um, but we can do it for a little while and then get up and go do something else. So we can sequence that uh, a, a perfective event with something else. So pussy dates. Um, here are some more examples of how this works. So we've already seen some of these individual classifiers. Here are some examples we have. Uh, we can make natural uh, um, perfectives, for example, with pause, za, and all of those 16 prefixes I mentioned before. So we have stroids, which means to build. Pastroids is also build. Varits, cooks. Varits is also cook. Kripits is to fasten. The kripits is also fasten. We've specialized like do, se, za, so all 17 of those prefixes we saw. So we have um, uh, da pisats, uh, finish writing, sabrats, collect, za pisats, register. But now to go over to these um, menstrual types. So we have a distributive, period, as in probovitz is to try something, but period probovitz is to try a whole series of things one after another. Um, brasats is to throw, but po brasats is to throw a bunch of things. Um, grishits is to sin, and with the cumulative non, the grishits is to do a lot of sinning, to commit a bunch of sins. We have individuating classifiers, so we have a delimitative, to do a little bit, like we saw with pasidates, or pejorative, like we saw with prapuakets. We also have attenuative. So uh, tarmazits is to break, like when you're driving a car, and pre-tarmazits is just to break a little bit. Um, sochnuts is to dry, pad sochnuts is to dry a little bit. Um, we have gavirits to talk, zgavirits suddenly begin to talk. Slujits is to uh, serve, and at slujits is to complete a service. Um, and then we have also some intensive resultatives, like dosya can be with plisats is to dance, da plisatsa, dance one's feet off, rabotits is uh, work, and the rabotits is to get so completely lost in one's work. We also, we already saw as glupits. Here's another one. This is actually with a suffix. Chichaits is to sneeze, and chichnuts is to sneeze just once. So these are the kinds of menstrual classifiers, in addition to sort of classifiers, that we see in these uh, Russian examples. Um, so I hope by now that I've uh, that I've proven to you that Russian prefixes can um, be understood as um, verb classifiers. That this makes sense to do, and I wanted to show you that we that when once we accept the verb classifier hypothesis, we can actually um, find further typological parallels that uh, that help us to see this as a coherent and sensible system. Um, and that is, again, um, analogous to the numeral classifiers. So, um, and these classifiers we're going to, these classifier parallels we're going to look at are a structured polysemy, foregrounding, and definiteness. 
So here's a tie classifier uh, that is prototypically used to refer to quadruped animals like um, buffalo and elephant. Um, but that there are various, um, there are other further uses that can be seen at, as part of a radial category of meanings of, um, of this classifier. So not only, it's used not only for animate quadrupeds, but it's also used for inanimate quadrupeds, such as tables and chairs, and then for furniture in general, whether or not it has four legs. Um, can also be used for limbed items, such as clothing uh, and clothing in general. Uh, can also be used for other animate items, especially ghosts and things that look like animate items. Um, including mannequins, dolls, and even some letters and numbers that have animate looking shapes. And we can compare this to the structured polysemy of Russian prefixes. I showed you previously a big table with 17 prefixes with, you know, very, very sets of meanings for all those. All of those uh, groups of meanings actually are related to each other in, um, in uh, structured polysemy. Um, similar to this. So here's the example for ras. So we have beats, which can mean break, um, and ras beat means break as well. So we have the sense of something coming apart. Um, now, but you can also, if you crush something, then you're destroying the internal structure of it, but the, and the edges might also move apart somewhat. So we're, but here we're focusing mostly on just destroying the internal integrity. Um, you can also focus just on the spreading of the edges. So here we have the spread meaning, uh, and vietvitsa, this comes from the word for branch. So this is like branching out. Um, and then we can also uh, have uh, focusing just on the, the, just on the edges of a three-dimensional object. So you have like swelling, like we saw with Razduts already. Both of these are related to excitement because when you add heat to something, it also swells and we can also have metaphorical uses related to that. Um, then we can also have um, the uh, spreading of uh, a liquid in another or a gas. And then we also have um, like if you put something together and take it apart that sort of a part. So the unloading, if you will. So putting something, and you can also use this um, metaphorically, for example, encipher and decipher. So, so un, undo something in that sense. So that was structured polysemy. Let's look at the foregrounding effects. Um, and here um, we can see that numeral classifiers are used often for, uh, for foregrounding. So in, uh, in narratives, uh, there's been a, a statistical study um, in which we see that in Mandarin Chinese, when an entity that is them thematically important in, in a narrative and is gonna be talked about later um, is introduced, it's often introduced with a classifier 80% of the time. But if you're introducing something else that's not so important, not so vivid for the, for the description, then oftentimes it's, in fact, most times it does not involve a classifier. So only 18% of the time will you use a classifier if it's something not so important. Here are some examples from the myth about this uh, big giant here, Kwafu, on the next slide. So here's a story about, uh, about Kwafu and, uh, and here we have that the important things was the place called Yodu, and here it gets a classifier. Um, and then there is also um, this big dark mountain um, that we're gonna talk more about here because that's, 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 part, that's the place where, where there's a scary monster, monster living. And then we're introducing uh, the main hero of the story, uh, the giant Kwafu, and he also gets a classifier. Um, so, so we see that the foregrounding items, foregrounded items are introduced with a classifier. And here's a kind of interesting uh, pair of examples because it's almost like a minimal pair. You have somebody who died and then there's a sudden transformation that takes place. 
Um, and in one case, it happens with a classifier and another case without a classifier. So Kwafu is important. He dies and his st stick changes into this, this really big, impressive peach tree with the blooming flowers. And we're making this very, in, in a very intense description by using this classifier or partly by using this classifier. Whereas Pongu, he dies and his body changes into a mountain and uh, there's, no, uh, there's no classifier there. So it's a rather relatively flat image. So what does this have to do with Russian prefixes? Um, in, uh, in, in Russian narratives, the um, plot line events uh, and the narrative sequencing, that's about prefixed perfective events. Um, so perfective aspect tends to mark these sequence plot, plot line events. So here we have we have um, a narrative. We have World War I began. The whole family um, uh, went to the village of Pominovo, blah, blah, blah. And my father met my mother and they got married. So the war beginning, the family moving, the meeting and the getting married, those are all perfective verbs with prefixes. Here we have nachalas, uyechala, poznachomilsa, and pozhenilis. But um, the other uh, the other things in here, the past uh, the, the, that are sort of in the background, you know, the where where they lived, that the that the um, house is still standing, uh, how old they were when they got married, those are those are imperfective. So we have a similar sort of foregrounding and backgrounding going on with. Uh, the use, the use or the absence of these um, prefixes, some cl as classifiers. Now let's move on to our third um, item, and that's definiteness. So um, the bare classifier constructions without uh, numerals tend to signal specific or definite reference. So here we have an example from Mong. Um, long ago, there was a wife and a husband. The husband died. So this is just classifier husband die perfected. Yeah. And the wife kept the wife kept crying, looking for the husband. So so we so we have this sort of definiteness coming uh, as as a sort of an effect, a weak effect of the numeral classifier. We see this also in this Vietnamese example. The library has a new accountant and a, and a new lawyer. And, and here now we're going to have a contrast. The accountant is hardworking, but the lawyer is lazy. So, and here we we use the classifier in both cases in order to sort of set up the definiteness for this um, for this contrast. So, what does this have to do with Russian? So, we have also uh, a definiteness effect of Russian prefixes. So, for example. Um, I can ask who read War and Peace in two different ways. I can ask it with a perfective verb, kto prachital vajnuimir, with this uh, nice prefix, pro, or I can use kto chital vajnuimir, with the imperfective. Um, but these are two, these are in a sense two different kinds of questions, because if I ask this A question, kto prachital vajnuimir, I am assuming that 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 there was there's there was some sort of an expectation that somebody was supposed to have read this and that we were going to discuss it. Um, it was an assignment for a class or something like this. But if I ask to Chital I knew him there, it might very well be the case that the person who says, oh yeah, I have has read the whole book cover to cover, but I'm just asking whether or not it's happened. So I, I don't need to use the perfective there. So it's kind of like more of a an expectation background shared information, if you will. Uh, similarly here with te prachital mayu knigu, did you read my book with perfective? I would be I would be wanting then to discuss my book with you because you, you've read my book. Um, but if I ask te chital mayu knigu, I, uh, then I'm, I'm probably not so interested in the contents of the book. I might have some other kind of question, like for example, um, you didn't see uh, uh, a note that I left there. I think I, I left something behind in my book. So the perfective sentences lack this kind of impl implication of uh, shared information in a specific event. Okay, so now I'm going to summarize because I'm coming close to the end of my time and to the end of my uh, end of my talk. So here are my conclusions. I hope that I have convinced you of this verb classifier hypothesis. 
that prefixes that form natural and specialized perfectives in Slavic languages parallel sortal numeral classifiers and prefixes that form procedural perfectives in Slavic languages. We see these mainly in East Slavic languages, but also to some extent in Bulgarian, a parallel menstrual numeral classifiers, and that there are shared traits of numeral classifiers and Slavic, Slavic aspectual prefixes. One noun or verb may combine with various classifiers. One classifier may have various functions when combined with various nouns and verbs. There is a structured polysemy of classifiers. Those meanings aren't just, you know, random chaotic sets. And there's a, the, and they can the classifiers can also achieve a certain kind of foregrounding and definiteness effects. And that recognition of the Slavic aspectual prefixes as verb classifiers facilitates typological comparison. And I think that in general, the um, verb classifier hypothesis, this makes it possible for us to take what is otherwise a really big and complex and um, apparently chaotic system and see it as something that's really coherent may, and makes a lot of sense. And that indeed, as, um, as uh, William McGregor um, predicted, there are verb classifier systems in in uh, in this world. In fact, they they are more common. They aren't just uh, you know, sort of rare in Chinese and 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 then found in some Australian languages. But they are an important feature of uh, one of one of the largest subfamilies of the Indo-European um, language family. So that's my entire talk. Um, you can find the re further references that I have uh, cited here in uh, in these works, and I will be very happy to uh, take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Yanda, for your presentation. It was really interesting, fascinating, challenging. Uh, theme uh, to hear from you. Uh, um, as a constructionist, I very like this, uh, like so much this uh, kind of thinking and uh, organization of the uh, meaning of those verbs, of those prefixes in a, a radial network of uh, meanings interrelated between them. Um, and I, I'm uh, uh, certain that I uh, could uh, hear from you uh, a lot of times that I can, of course, uh, understand really, really what you are uh, going to uh, show us, because I think this is really a, a difficult theme. Uh, uh, but I have uh, some questions for you. Uh, they can be um, a little bit naive, I, uh, if I may say so, but uh, from a constructionist uh, point of view, for example, we could talk about a, a network of interrelated constructions of classification for those verbs in Russian. For example, we could have a constru an abstract constructions to mark uh, perfective aspect in Russian uh, and uh, more specific nodes of uh, more specified constructions that would uh, reflect some clusters of meanings that will attract some verbal steams to that network. Uh, I, yeah, I think uh, you you already thought about this kind of description of the uh, verbal uh, um, system of the Russian language, and I would be glad to hear from you a little about that. Uh, if you can uh, talk a little about that, it would be fine. It, it, it will be great. Yeah, yeah. So we have we have worked a lot uh, looking at um, the natural perfectives. So the ones that are, you know, that are, for example, listed in the dictionaries as being, um, as, as having the same meaning as the um, simplex verbs. 
and also at um, the um, relatively high frequency specialized perfecta. So we've looked at several thousand verbs and indeed uh, tried to work out what are what are all of those relationships. But, you know, I mean, it's a <laughs> it's a very complex system. And I think this was also part of the motivation for doing this research is that we've been told we've been told traditionally that these prefixes sometimes have no meaning, that they are empty. empty. And um, you know, then you're then you're kind of like facing the um, the claim that there's like 2000 combinations of these things that are completely meaningless, you know, and, and that you just you just have to memorize. I mean, I, I certainly I'm willing to accept that there are things in language that you just have to memorize that happens. Right. But but why 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 would this why would this be the case and why would there be why would there be no rhyme or reason, no, uh, no coherent story? And this is our attempt to to make a real coherent story out of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I I I could note that this there is some kind of thing that uh, there is a semantic coherence between those themes that can occur to that kind of prefix in order to make a natural perfective. And it's very interesting for me. But uh, considering that you were, uh, uh, you and your group were uh, uh, studying a long list of verbs in Russian, you know, more than a thousand verbs in Russian, uh, have you found some verb in which the combination of the same with the uh, prefix is not, it's not so clear at all so that you could argument uh, that there is some kind of um, overlapping of meanings between the, the steam and the prefix. And if so, uh, how uh, do you analyze, the, uh, did you analyze these verbs? And uh, another question, uh, another question that is related with these questions, for example, uh, it's possible to identify some kind of semantic bleaching, for example. Uh, these uh, combinations are used so frequently, so regularly, that today the meaning of the theme or the meaning of the combination is not so transparent to identify some kind of correlation between uh, steam and uh, prefix. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with uh, some of the big prefixes, if you will, like po and pro and za. You know, some of these that are, that take any that are that are basically like default. But the, but then there's still the the analogy with the numeral classifiers because, for example, in Mandarin Chinese, you have the um, uh, general classifier g which uh, you can you can use anytime you don't know what the classifier is or you you you're just you need to use a classifier so that, so that's very similar to po where it has uh, it has uh, extremely bleached meaning s so also often has a very bleached meaning so, so absolutely but you know if we can at least uh reduce if we, we can at least make sense of some of this as a meaningful system rather than as just a, a, a chaotic uh, a, a chaotic system. I think we're we're achieving something better as linguists and also as teachers of languages. Of course, of course. Um, you said something about the suffix no. Mm -hmm. uh, in Chifnet, uh, for example, uh, I was thinking about if this uh, approach would be uh, applied to, to the for, uh, suffixes in Russian, but I, I, I don't think so. Uh, what do you think about that? For example, uh, verbs how, uh, like, uh, Paftariat, paftarit, for example, I don't, I can't uh, identify uh, some kinds of classification between those verbs, and there is some kind of uh, difficulty in establishing if it is a suffix or not. For example, zanyat, uh, zanyat, 
for example, verbs of this kind uh, of group, panimats, uh, panyats, for example. Uh, uh, did you think about those verbs? If you mention it, if you have mentioned it, a new, the, the suffix no. So have you thinking uh, on this uh, other possibilities of uh, alternations between uh, the, the formation of uh, perfective and imperfective verbs? And how would you approach those verbs? Because uh, you were saying that uh, the majority yeah, of the verbs in Russian are covered by this approach. Yeah, mm. uh, but we have some uh, occurrences that are uh, out of that uh, coverage. Uh, and there is some kind of possibility to apply this approach to such verbs. Yeah, so um, considering moods, moods is a perfectivizer. I'm, I'm talking about the perfectivizing moods. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's also yeah. there's other nudes too, but um, but uh, news as a perfectivizer, it it behaves much as the as the prefixes do. So, but only as a procedural type. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of uh, on one side of the system there. But as far as the um, imperfectivizing prefix uh, suffixes, so we have um, uh, a ya va and iva iva iva. Um, so we have those. Th we have these three suffixes, but these three suffixes they are not. Um, uh, they do not sort the verbs into uh, semantically. They sort them into mm -hmm. the classes. So there are certain there are certain conjugation classes that take certain suffixes. So that's really about conjugation classes and not about semantics. Okay, okay. So I think. Uh, uh, that we are going to the end of this talk. Okay, thank uh, you so much. And thanks to everybody so, who, is, uh, who is online. I would like on behalf of Everlyn to thank you uh, one more time for agreeing to give this talk to us. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear from you, uh, to hear this, this amazing talk about the uh, verbal classifiers. And I would like to invite everyone here to continue to uh, attending the talks, uh, the amazing talks in this amazing initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. Uh, stay everybody safe while the vaccine is not available to everyone. And see you soon in one more session of Eberlin. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>